In this video, we're reviewing runner's lane interference under NFHS baseball rules. These calls almost always generate a lot of interest when they happen in a major league baseball game, and we'll break down what we need to be looking for when enforcing it in a high school game. So quickly, we'll review the rules and definitions associated with runner's lane, and after that, we'll dive into this week's case plays. As always, if you wanna see how well you can do on the quiz before reviewing them with me, you can find that in the video description. Hi everyone, Patrick Farber here from GHSA Baseball Umpire Development and Umpire Classroom, where we help umpires to develop their knowledge and skills. We're getting close to the end of the season here in Georgia. And with the end of the season, I'll be able to work on some new projects and new videos for all of you. If you have any videos that you'd like to see, be sure to leave your ideas in the video description. To start, let's review the rules that have to do with the runner's lane. We can find this in rule eight, which covers base running, section four, which covers when runners are out. Rule 8-4-1G, the batter runner is out when he runs outside the three foot running lane, last half of the distance from home plate to first base, while the ball is being fielded or thrown to first base. The infraction is ignored if it is to avoid a fielder who is attempting to field the batted ball, or if the act does not interfere with a fielder or a throw. The batter runner is considered outside the running lane lines if either foot is outside either line. So in this rule, there's a couple of things that we absolutely have to focus on. First, the rule says that the ball must be being fielded or thrown to first base. This is important for two reasons. First, we must have a throw to first base. Just because the batter runner is not in the runner's lane does not mean that they're going to be out if there's no attempted play at first. Now, the second part of this is that it says the ball must be fielded or thrown towards first base. This means that on a ball that's hit to the first baseman, the runner's lane doesn't apply if that first baseman is trying to throw home to make a play. The runner's lane only applies when it's a play being thrown into first base. Then on top of all this, a key note for NFA Just Baseball, the interference doesn't have to do with whether or not the first baseman was able to field the thrown ball. Instead, in NFA Just Baseball, so long as the throw does not retire the runner, the runner is out simply for having not been in the runner's lane. This means the quality of the throw has no effect on whether or not we're going to make this call. We just need to make sure that we do have a throw towards first base. Now, as the notes on this rule state, if the throw is able to retire the batter runner at first, then the interference is ignored. Also, if the runner is out of the runner's lane to avoid a fielder trying to make a play on the ball, then there is no violation of the rule. Now, before we dive into this week's case plays, let's review the rules around the base runner leaving the baseline. We can find this in rule 8-4-2, and it says, any runner is out when he runs more than three feet away from a direct line between bases to avoid being tagged or to hinder a fielder while the runner is advancing or returning to a base. This is not an infraction if a fielder attempting to field a batted ball is in the runner's proper path and if the runner runs behind the fielder to avoid interfering with him. When a play is being made on a runner or batter runner, he establishes his baseline as directly between his position and the base towards which he is moving. Now, the important part of this is knowing that the runner's lane is different than the base path. The runner's lane is always going to be the same space on any play. However, the base path is only defined when a fielder starts to make a tag attempt on a runner. At that point, the runner towards the bag that he is advancing to has only three feet to either side that he can move without being out of the base path. It's important to know that just being in the runner's lane doesn't necessarily mean that you haven't violated and left the base path. If you wanna see an example of this in a major league game, I'll have a video linked in the video description. Great, so now that we've reviewed the rules associated with the runner's lane, let's go ahead and jump through this week's case plays. Case play number one. With R3 on third base, B2 hits a fair ground ball to F3, who fields the ball beyond first base. He throws to F2, attempting to retire R3. The throw hits B2, who is running in the runner's lane, and does not intentionally interfere with the ball. Is this A, this is interference, B2 is out and R3 is returned to third base. B, this is interference, B2 is out and R3 is out. 
Or C, this is not interference. The correct answer here is C, this is not interference. Because the ball is being thrown to the plate, the runner's lane has no effect on this play. So long as the runner does not intentionally try to break up the play, this is a clean play. Case play number two. With R3 on third base, B2 hits a fair ground ball to F3, who fields the ball beyond first base. He throws to F2, attempting to retire R3. The throw hits B2, who is running in fair territory and does not intentionally interfere with the ball. Is this A, this is interference, B2 is out and R3 is returned to third base. B, this is interference, B2 is out and R3 is out. Or C, this is not interference. Again, the answer here is C, this is not interference. Because this ball is being fielded by the first baseman and thrown to the plate, the runner's lane does not apply in this case play. So long as the runner does not do anything to intentionally interfere with that throw from the first baseman to the catcher, then there's no violation on this rule and the play stands. Case play number three. With R3 on third base, B2 bunts a ball that is fielded by F2. F2 throws to F3 and the ball hits B2 in the back. B2 is in the runner's lane. Is this A, this is interference, B2 is out and R3 is returned to third base. B, this is interference, B2 is out and R3 is out. Or C, this is not interference. In this case play, the runner's lane does apply since the ball is being thrown from the catcher to first base. And because the batter runner is in the runner's lane, there's no interference and this play stands. Case play number four. With R3 on third base, B2 bunts a ball that is fielded by F2. F2 throws to F3 and the ball hits B2 in the back. B2 is in fair territory and not in the runner's lane. Is this A, this is interference, B2 is out and R3 is returned to third base. B, this is interference, R2 is out and R3 is out. Or C, this is not interference. The correct answer here is A, this is runner's lane interference. We have a ball that is being thrown to first base by the catcher, and the batter runner is not in the runner's lane when a throw is being made to first base, and that throw does not retire the runner. The batter runner will be out for violating the runner's lane rules, and all of the runners will be returned to where they were at the time of pitch. Case play number five. With R3 on third base, B2 bunts a ball that is fielded by F2. F2 attempts to throw to F3, but because B2 is outside of the runner's lane and in the way, F2 tries to throw over B2's head. The throw goes 10 feet over the head of F2. Is this A, this is interference, B2 is out and R3 is returned to third base. B, this is interference, B2 is out and R3 is out. Or C, this is not interference. The correct answer here is A, this is interference. This is a play that would have a different ruling at other levels of baseball. But for Federation rules, whether or not the first baseman is able to field a thrown ball has nothing to do with the enforcement of this rule. Instead, so long as an attempt is made to retire the batter runner at first base, if that throw does not retire the batter runner and the batter runner is outside of the runner's lane, then they have violated the runner's lane rules. The batter runner will be out for that violation and all other runners will be returned back to their position at the time of pitch. Case play number six. With R3 on third base, B2 bunts a ball that is fielded by F2. F2 attempts to throw to F3, but because B2 is outside of the runner's lane and in the way, F2 does not throw the ball and no play is made. Is this A, this is interference, B2 is out and R3 is returned to third base, B, this is interference, B2 is out and R3 is out. Or C, this is not interference. The correct answer here is C, this is not interference. Because the ball is never thrown to first base, we can't have a runner's lane violation. The runner's lane rule specifically says that the ball must be being fielded or thrown to first base. Without a throw, there's no violation and this play will stand. Case play number seven. With R3 on third base, B2 bunts a ball that is fielded by F2. F2 throws to F3, but the throw is deflected when it hits B2, who is running in fair territory 15 feet away from home plate. Is this A, this is interference, B2 is out and R3 is returned to third base. 
B, this is interference, B2 is out, and R3 is out, or C, this is not interference. The correct answer here is C, this is not interference. We need to remember that the runner's lane rule only comes into effect halfway between home and first. With the height school base pass being 90 feet, that means that the last 45 feet is when the runner's lane rule applies. In this case play, since the batter runner is only 15 feet away from the plate, then they're not in that last half of the runner's lane. For that reason, we can't have a runner's lane interference. The only interference that could happen on this play is if we have intentional interference by the batter runner. But since we don't have that, this is a legal play and the play stands. Case play number eight. With R3 on third base, B2 bunts a ball up the first base line that is fielded by F1. B2 is running in fair territory. When F1 goes to tag B2, B2 moves laterally more than three feet, but is able to stay in the runner's lane and proceed to first without being tagged. R3 scores. Is this A, this is interference, B2 is out and R3 is returned to third base, B, this is interference, B2 is out and R3 is out. C, B2 is out for having left the baseline, R3 scores. D, B2 is out for having left the baseline, R3 is returned to third. Or E, this is a legal play. The correct answer here is C. B2 is going to be out for having left the baseline. We need to remember that the baseline is determined from the runner's position in a straight line directly to the bag they're advancing to three feet to their left or three feet to their right from the time that a tag attempt is made. This means if they're running outside of the runner's lane in fair territory and then a tag attempt is made, the runner's lane is going to have nothing to do with the enforcement on this play. Instead, the base path rules will have the effect. So when they run to their right more than three feet into the runner's lane that they were originally supposed to have been in, the runner's lane isn't going to protect them from the fact that they veered more than three feet out of the way to avoid the tag. Just know that when we have a runner that leaves the base path, that runner is out, but the ball remains live and all other playing action continues. So there you have it, this week's review of runner's lane interference in high school rules. If you found this video helpful, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if there's any video ideas that you'd like to see, you can leave your ideas in the comments below. Thanks again for watching everyone, and as always, I look forward to seeing you on the field.